Well, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to announce to you that we've hit one of my favorite verses today. In fact, just for your convenience, I'm only going to cover two verses today. It's because I want to get a day off. That's really what it is. I'm tired. No, it's just incredibly rich. If you guys are familiar with Romans chapter 12, it's the shifting in gears where Paul goes from his deep theological teaching to practical application. And Paul, in, in many of his writings, does this. He goes from this wonderful greeting uh, that's usually personal to who, whoever he's writing, whether it be a church or a person. Then he gets into this deep theological stuff. And then he shifts gears into application. And so we're about to go into the application of everything we've learned from Romans chapter 1 all the way through to the end of 11 where it talks about Israel we're going to put this into application for us as the church. And I, I love looking into passages like this because it's very relevant to the way that we live. Now that we have an understanding of the doctrine, of the understanding of what God does and how he behaves with us, now we know what it is that he expects of us as we move forward. So I'm going to just remind you of where we've been from chapters 1 to 11. All of what he has taught throughout there, he's now going to apply from chapter 12 and forward. And so let's get on with it. These are the two verses that we will cover today, if I'm lucky. But before we do, let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace in our lives. Thank you for your very presence that you give to us as a gift, that you send your Holy Spirit not only to preside over what we do here, but also within us. And we thank you for that. Thank you for the time of worship when we were able to pour out our hearts before you. I pray that you might help us to make those words a complete reality in our entire week. And Lord, I thank you for all those that are here and those who are listening. I pray that you would use me to speak your word in your way so that we might be able to put a handle on it. And we might be able to live for you. So, Lord, I thank you. Superintend all that we do here, Lord, in our minds and hearts. And I pray that we might be able to go away with a deeper understanding of you. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace, for your sacrifice on the cross, for your demonstration of selflessness and love and commitment to do the right thing. I pray that you might grow that in each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans chapter 12 begins with verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So you can see why I took only two verses. I'm going to give you a variant if you want to read it in a different version. This is the J.B. Phillips version, which expands on it a little bit. With eyes wide open to the mercies of God, I beg you, my brothers, as an act of intelligent worship, to give him your bodies as a living sacrifice, consecrated to him and acceptable by him. And don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove in practice that the plan of God for you is good and meets all his demands and moves toward the goal of true maturity." gives you a slightly different take on it for those of you who have this thing memorized. It, uh, it gets confusing sometimes. So he begins with saying, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. You guys use beseech a lot no. in the conversation? No. Beseech. I find, it, uh, I find it good to do research on these things. It means to beg. It means to plead. 
It means to come alongside and say, hey, 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 I, I want to reason with you here. That's what I beseech is. So I have an emoji for that. That's the beseech emoji. He begins with this very, very soft heart as he's coming out and he's saying, listen, by the mercies of God, brethren, and he, and he calls, these are, these are not unbelievers he's speaking to. These are believers. So this is for us. And he continues to beg. If you remember Bugs Bunny with that look right before he was about to pull off some shenanigans. That's the, that's the begging, pleading, beseeching thing. And that's what Paul is saying as he begins. Or, or if you know... If you remember this cat from the pictures, the moving pictures, yes. Uh, it's beseeching, okay? It, ha it has a big heart to it so that you understand what it is. But I think of my grandchildren when they say, please, please. It's kind of like that. So Paul, after this heavy doctrinal statement, he says, you know, I wish I could die for my people if it were possible. You know, I have, I have such a, a heart for the, the Jews. And he, he's really pouring his heart out. And then he says, listen, I got to plead with you guys to do something here. And before he does that, he goes that. He goes into, therefore, I beseech you, therefore, which means because of everything in the past 11 chapters that I wrote to you, okay? So I won't necessarily go over everything we went over in the last 11 chapters because you don't have all day. Because of or since is really what therefore means. It means because of these things or since all of these things, he's trying to come to a summation like any good pastor, except it usually comes, you know, an hour before he's actually done. Because of or since is what that means. And, he, you know, the mercies of God. Well, what are the mercies of God? Well, because of or since, all the other things that we talked about, like justification from the guilt, the penalty, and the power of sin through Jesus Christ, his sacrifice on the cross, our adoption in Jesus, our identification with Christ, we have been placed under grace, not the law. We've been given the Holy Spirit to live within us, the promise to help us in all of our affliction. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. God's assurance that we have been elected and chosen not on the, on the basis of our perfection, but on the basis of his love for us, which is a much better currency to trade in. Confidence of the coming glory, no separation from the love of God and God's continued faithfulness to us. Amen? Amen. And so because of all these things, since all of these things are true, therefore he's going to make a statement about the mercies of God. And notice he says, by the mercies of God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you know, since these are the mercies of God, and it's because God has done all these things that is now going to motivate us to do the next thing, which is to present ourselves a living sacrifice. We don't do it to get God's mercy. We don't do it for God's approval. We do it from God's approval. Amen? Amen. You're already approved, forgiven. You're already seated in heaven as far as God's concerned. It's a done deal. So because of that, since all these things are true, then it, we're able to do something like lay down our lives. But without that, it's just trying to work your way to heaven, which a lot of people try to do. In fact, every other religion on the planet does that. So mercy. Because we are free, we can serve him. And because we're no longer chained to our sin, we can be free. And that, that's great news, right? Are you living that life? We're free. I mean, unless you own a cell phone, and then you might be chained to your cell phone. You might be in bondage to your cell phone. I don't know. It could happen. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, speaking to a Jewish audience, they would understand what that means. A sacrifice is what they would bring, and you'd have to do it at least once a year and on the Day of Atonement. There would be a sacrifice, a perfectly innocent lamb that was perfect in every way, never did anything wrong, is going to be a sacrifice for you, and what you lay your hands on its living head as they kill it beneath you. And your sins are then transferred because in faith you're believing God and doing what he asked you to do. So that is the sacrifice that the Jew would be familiar with. But a living sacrifice, that's a little different, isn't it? Usually sacrifices, you know, they get, they get dead real quick. I, let's see if I can do that again. 
Proverbs 6, 12 to 19 talks about the activity of our bodies. You know, there's, there's no sin that you can commit without your body. There's no such thing as an out-of-body sin. You need your body to perform sinful acts. Think about it. If you read just through Proverbs 6, just one little example of it, think, think of all the anatomical parts that are being mentioned here. A worthless person, a wicked man, walks a perverse mouth. He winks with his eyes. He shuffles with his feet. That's like when he, somebody's trying to hit you under the table to, to shut up about something because something dishonest you're not supposed to be talking about. He points with his fingers, like secretly behind your back. Perversity is in his heart. He devises evil continually. He sows discord. Therefore, his calamity will come suddenly. Suddenly, he will be broken without remedy. These are the six things that the Lord hates. It's good to take note of. These are the six things that the Lord hates. Yes, seven that are an abomination to him. A proud look is the first one. And you use what? Your eyes. You know, you ever, you ever walk into a store like you want to buy something and the clerk takes a look at you and goes, what, my money's no good here. A proud look. That's the first thing the Lord hates. Isn't that interesting? But you can't have a proud look without a proud heart. So it begins there. A proud look. Lying tongue. Now, we all know that the tongue doesn't lie. It just does what you tell it to, right? A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, since those are the things that locate you there, a false witness that speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. So if you're a person who spreads story or gossip or tries, um, you know, giving information to both sides to get them to fight, that's one of the things that the Lord hates. He hates that kind of stuff. And notice every single one of them has an activity of the body. You need your mind, you need your heart, but then there are all the other things that are going to follow along in suit. And so when he says I, that you should present your bodies as a living sacrifice, you have to understand that that means from head to toe. And whatever we have to do to actually do this, I don't know about you, but sometimes I sit and pray in the morning and I just, I go from the top of my head to the bottom of my foot and I pray over all the parts of my body that they might glorify God in every way. That somebody wouldn't misunderstand a look on my face or a word on my tongue or I shouldn't listen to things that I shouldn't, or watch things on the internet that I shouldn't, that, that my heart would not become bitter and angry and resentful and vengeful, uh, that, that my arms would labor to, to serve the Lord and to serve primarily his, his people. You know, that, all, that you know, I wouldn't eat things that I shouldn't eat, you know, and you pray for your, your gut. And, you know, you just go all the way down and all the way back up and just sacrifice all those things to the Lord. You should try that sometime because that's what it is to be a living sacrifice. It means to be alive and yet given over to the Lord's purposes and not living for the next appetite or the next new thing that's out or the next whatever it is that you think that you need. Oh, oh, well, God's got to send me a woman, you know, or God's got to send me a, I got to get a new car, I got to get that new iPhone, or I got to, whatever it is, we tend to go from appetite to appetite and our bodies rule us instead of us ruling our bodies. Wow, okay. I thought that was pretty profound. But we need our bodies and so God says, what I want you to do I beseech you, I'm begging you, please, brethren, by the mercies of God, because God's been so merciful, he's been so good, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. It, it's just a very simple thing to read through, and especially if you have it memorized, but then to think about it and take it to heart and say, does my life match that? It's a very different thing. Romans 8, verses 8 to 10, which we've gone over, Paul says, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. He doesn't mean those who are alive who aren't dead. He means those who are not dead to their bodies and haven't sacrificed them to God. Are you not 
in the, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. You see, living as a Christian means my body's dead. I don't, you know, dead people don't respond to anything. Sound, physical violence, they don't respond. Uh, bright lights in their face, they don't respond. That's what we're to be, is to be dead. Because the spirit of God lives in us and we live for the things that God has put upon us through his spirit. So you know what you need to do? Have a funeral. Have your own funeral. You think I'm kidding. Lord, I just want to go over there and smack that guy. Now, if I respond to that, I'm not dead. <laughs> but if I'm dead to my flesh, I won't do that. And I'll give it to the Lord and I'll pray for that person. You see how that works? That, you know, I, as soon as service is done, I'm leaving here. I'm going to a pizzeria. I'm getting the biggest pizza I can with everything on it. I'm going to eat every piece. And I can sit here and think about it and I can watch the clock and say, why isn't he going any faster? <laughs> but you see, that's letting your body run you. That's not you running your body. And it's, it's one of those things that the world just presses us into its mold and we begin to just think our life is all about doing what we want. And it's not. It's about doing what the Lord wants. And that's when we have life and peace. That's what the scripture assures us. And I can tell you that's true. And those of you who know, say amen. amen. Doing what the Lord would have you do always ends up being awesome in the end. And you might get some flack for it and you might get some criticism and some of that proud look, but it's better all the way around. So have a funeral, put your body to bed and say, that's it, body, you're done running me because I am, I am alive because of the Lord God Almighty and the Spirit of God is going to lead me and I'm going to be a living sacrifice. Amen? Amen. A living sacrifice. It's interesting because the scripture kind of flips this around. If you remember Hosea 6.6, 6, it says, God says through the prophet Hosea, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. So one of you might say, well, Pastor Dave, that's, this says God doesn't want to sacrifice. What do you say about that? It's people like Jenna that ask me questions like that all the time. <laughs> Pastor Dave, I have a question. I'm like, okay. Put your belt on. Here we go. And I love that. I love that. It used to be Monica. Monica would ask me all the questions. <laughs> Pastor Dave, I hope I'm not bothering you, but I wanted to ask you a question about something that's been on my mind. And she'd get this whole big introduction, and I'm like, okay, okay. And she'd, she'd ask me a question. It's great. I love that. I love it. You can ask me any question you want, as long as you really want the answer, because maybe you don't. But it says here that God does not desire a sacrifice, but mercy. And yet, we see in the New Testament that he wants a living sacrifice. So what's that about? Hmm, I guess the Bible is contradictory after all. You think I lost my faith, don't you? Okay. Jesus says in Matthew 12, 7 to the Pharisees, but if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. See, the Pharisees were pointing the finger at Jesus' disciples because they were eating some granola on the way to church. You know, they were pulling heads of grain off and they were, you know, getting all the, the mess and all that fluff off and blowing it off. And then they were eating the little grains on the top of, uh, you've probably never done this uh, in New Jersey, but uh, you can do that. If, it, if the grain has come to head, you can take it off. And it's what they use to grind and make bread anyway. So, but it's a little like having a little granola on your way to go to synagogue. And the Pharisees started pointing to Jesus and say, these guys are doing what's unlawful on the Sabbath because they're reaping, which is pulling off the head. And then they were winnowing, which is, you know, separating all the good stuff. And then they were blowing it, blowing it off, and then they were just eating it. So that's work. And Jesus said, you know, you need to consider what the passage says here in Hosea that I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Because they were so tight about the rules and keeping rules, they thought they were right before God because they were rule keepers and their hearts were far from him. 
it's not the kind of sacrifice that God wants where it's just external. What he wants is your heart. What he wants is the sacrifice of you, a living sacrifice, which looks a little weird. <laughs> you, you can throw yourself on an altar and say, okay, Lord, here I am. Take my life if you want me. You know, find a tree stump and, and uh, lay yourself out. But what God really wants is all of us. He doesn't want just the performance. He wants our heart. Like worship would be worthless if it was just music. Like if you, you can go to a nightclub and listen to music all day long and they talk about things that are unconscionable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but worship is something else because the words mean something and it's toward God and it's something that draws us near to him and it's something that we have a commonality in. Worship is a much different thing than a performance, and so I try never to perform I, I, because the, the music won't mean a thing if your heart's not in it. And so that's what it is to be a living sacrifice. Jesus didn't die so that we could have a religion. He died so that we could have a relationship with your heavenly Father. Amen. And that's the thing that God wants. He wants us. He doesn't want the stuff we do if our heart's not in it. He wants our heart, our mind. He wants all of us. Sure, we should do all those things that the Lord would have us do, but if it's not coming from a right heart, then it's kind of worthless. In fact, in another place, he says, I wish they would shut the doors of the temple and they would stop all the sacrifices because it's a, it's a mess. I, I wish somebody would stop this because it's all performance. And so we have to make sure that we're a living sacrifice before the Lord. Uh, D.L. Moody said, the main problem with a living sacrifice is that it keeps crawling off the altar. <laughs> and and you, you know what I'm talking about if you've ever gone on a diet or if you've ever decided that you're going to do something or you're going to save money or, you know, whatever it is that you decided you're going to do. I'm going to stop smoking. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to stop, you know, cursing. I'm going to stop uh, beating up people, whatever your thing is. The thing is that living sacrifices are still living. The dead sacrifice just lays there. It's a once and done thing. But a living sacrifice is really moment by moment, isn't it? Religion says do. Jesus says done. Religion says you're a slave. Jesus says you're a son. Religion puts you in bondage while Jesus sets you free because he gives us the right kind of heart to do those things he wants us to do, and those things become part of our new nature. And it's no longer forcing ourselves to do something that's contrary to what we want to do, really, in our heart. So you can have rules, and you can have regulations, and you can have religion, or you can have a relationship. And God did everything that he did by sending his son to die for us so that we might have a conversational, moment-by-moment, -moment, daily relationship with him, where we are the living sacrifices and he is the one who is living through us. Amen? Amen? Faith in Jesus is not religion. Religious people executed Jesus. And I don't want to be one of those religious people who really doesn't want anything to do with Jesus other than having some external form. By the way, that's what a living sacrifice looks like if you forgot. Jesus came... God incarnate came into the body of a woman and was born, lived a perfect life, and then died for you and me. That's a living sacrifice. And it's no different than what Jesus did for us. And that's why Jesus is our Savior, right? That's why he's our example. He's the one that we look to because he was a living sacrifice, literally. And so God asks us to do the very same thing. And it says that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Isn't it interesting that God finds whatever it is that you do as acceptable and holy? Did you ever think of yourself as having anything quite that valuable? <laughs> You know, like, like the little kid that, that gives mommy a picture, you know, a, ha a finger painted something and you don't even know what it is. And this is for you. 
and you go, wow, what is it? And then, of course, you get the explanation of everything that it is. And then you go look in the dining room, and there's paint everywhere. <laughs> That's the way I feel about anything that I would give to the Lord. It's flawed. It's simplistic. And I can't do any of that stuff without him giving me all the paints and the paper. And the, You know, he's the one that gave us life. So how do you give anything to God that he finds to be holy and acceptable? Some of you have a very low self-esteem. Don't think you could ever do anything that makes God happy. This scripture says, when you give yourself to him as a living sacrifice, this sacrifice is holy. God sees it as a sacred thing. And it could be the simplest thing, right? Like I, I drop the clicker and somebody rushes over to pick it up and give it to me. That's a holy and acceptable sacrifice. Whatever the simplicity is of it, whatever smallness it is, it is holy and acceptable to God. And we don't think of worship that way. In fact, your work is worship. If you're doing it for the Lord, if you're just doing it for money, then it's just work. But if you're doing it for the Lord, it's worship. It doesn't matter if you collect tolls in the parkway or whether you're a steel erector in New York City or whether you're a construction person or you're digging a ditch or whatever it is that you do, you can do it unto the Lord and it's a holy and acceptable sacrifice to him. Did you know that? You thinking about, hey, I wonder how so-and-so is doing. Bless you. I wonder how so-and-so is doing. And you pick up the phone and you call them and say, hey, the Lord put you on my heart. What's going on? How are you? That is a holy and acceptable thing that God finds a sacrifice. When you go out of your way to do that, which the Holy Spirit prompts you to do. And so you could be worshiping God every minute of the day in everything that you do. And that's the way it's supposed to be. But you know what? Living sacrifices crawl off the altar, don't they? And so it's so easy to get back into the worldly mode of just doing, okay, what's the next thing I got to do? What's the next thing I feel like doing? I don't know. Let me see. And it's, we just live and our body tells us what to do as opposed to the spirit of God. And then there's no joy in it. Little boy says, it's all I have. And Jesus says, it's all I want. That's all he wants. Just all of us. It says here in Psalm 51, David being a demonstration of what this looks like to be a living sacrifice. This is when he got busted, when he got convicted, when the prophet Nathan came to him and he realized that he was deep in sin and he was far from God and he hadn't been in fellowship with God and he was just running. He was just running on selfishness. Verse five picks up, says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. In other words, I was born into sin. And in sin, my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop. It's a, it's a kind of a, a, like a scrub brush, if you will. Uh, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Now he's talking about spiritually because he was dirty with sin. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones that you have broken may rejoice. He felt so bad, even people's laughter and happiness never affected him. He wasn't able to join in with it because he was in sin against God. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. For you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. God tells us through the psalmist, the one thing that God really wants from us is a broken, humble heart where we come to him and say, listen, I'm not all that in a bag of chips. I'm just not, and I need you and I need you to fix what's going on inside my heart. God accepts that as holy and an acceptable sacrifice. I don't know about you, but that, that's a really difficult thing to kind of choke up, right? Talk about the things you do wrong and your shortcomings. And Paul says, I boast in those things now because God's not taking them away. So I boast and I tell everybody, yeah, I'm a schmuck. You know, I don't, I don't do what I should. I, I fall short in so many ways. He says he's, he, he boasts of it. 
that of his frailty so that through his frailties, God might make him stronger and people will see God's glory. So here's David just pouring out his soul and that is the kind of a sacrifice God really wants, is a humble heart. Isn't it refreshing to find somebody with that who's willing to talk just openly about the, the, where they fall short and maybe how the Lord's brought them through? That's, that's incredibly helpful and encouraging. It's, it's always rough to be around somebody who's always trying to, you know, one-up you. You know? Oh, yeah. I had to go out and shovel the snow. Oh, yeah? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> I had some snow. It snowed more on my house than it did on yours. I can tell you that. In fact, I got two houses, and I had to shovel both of them. Nobody ever feels bad for somebody like that, right? I had to go to work. I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm dead. I can't. I, I'm not. I'm not alive to my body. It is a holy, living sacrifice unto God, which is your reasonable service. Isn't it reasonable that Jesus would ask us to do something similar to what He did, but not to the same extent? Isn't that reasonable? God sent his only son to die for me so that I might have new life. Is it only reasonable he expects me to behave like a Christian? Behave like Jesus? It's only reasonable. It's not like, oh, I gotta die to myself, that pastor, what's he talking about? I, no, it's reasonable. It makes sense. If you're really the Lord's and you're really dead to yourself now, you don't live for your own lusts and desires, you live for him. It's not unusual. It's not strange. It's not some bizarre request. Because look what he did. It is our reasonable service, and some versions say reasonable service of worship. It is, it is a right response to a thankful heart to serve the Lord with your whole heart. In Luke 14, 27 and 33, it says, For whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Jesus said it just real plain. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus asks for everything. And this isn't unusual. You know, if you go to a church that says, well, Jesus didn't mean what he said he meant. You need to go find somewhere else. If I ever say that, you should leave here. Likewise, whoever you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple because the Lord is looking for people that he can trust. And he's only going to be able to trust you if you do what he says. And you're not going to get the blessings that God really wants to give to you if you're going to shortchange yourself by being disobedient. And that's really what it is. So, that's one verse. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And so usually when I get to a place and I'm studying, I start asking myself questions. Do you love God for his love or from his love? Do you love God to impress him? Do you do all those things that you know you should do because, well, they're the right thing to do and you know you got to do them? Or do you do it because he loves you? Because when you do it as a response to your love for somebody, it, it's a wonderful thing. If you have a little child who does something out of love for you, it's a wonderful thing. If they do it because it was an assignment, it doesn't mean anything, right? At least from the heart standpoint. So do you love God because he loves you or do you do it so he loves you? It's a good question. Have you sacrificed your entire self to him? How many of you feel that you have something you can bring to God today? I imagine we all do. Because none of us are, are ready, right? None of us are perfect. Does your body rule you? How can you fix that? Scripture says right here. Will you decide to give a holy, acceptable, and reasonable sacrifice in service to the Savior? You see, as I'm speaking, I'm aware that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about things in your life because God loves you. And if you have a relationship with him, you have the Spirit of God. And if you don't have the Spirit of God, then you're not his, and you don't know what I'm talking about. 
But because you do, I know God speaks to your heart as well. So I ask myself these questions as well. And then can you truly live without taking the next step? Can you truly live the life that God wants you to live without being a living sacrifice? You can't. And you know what? The Christian life isn't all rules and regulations and got to do's and have to do's and better go and stop that. And You get focused in on that, then the relationship's gone. It's evaporated. It's like having a marriage where, you know, I put my money in the bank, my wife spends it all, I go make some more. You know, where's the love? You know, where's the relationship? And that's what happens. We can't live without it. Verse two, and we're moving along. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't be conformed to this world. You know what it is to be conformed to this world? It means to be pressed into the world's mold so that you look like the world. So the world tells you, you know, you know, you have to have this brand new Cadillac because it's the height of perfection. I was walking through the mall the other day and I looked at, they had these cars out in the, in the middle of the mall and I started looking at the price tags, $64,000. It does the same thing my car does. I mean... The paint job was awesome. <laughs> but would you put yourself in bondage? I'm not going to be pressed into the world's mold. The TV is going to tell me I need this. I have to have that. You can't do with it the other thing. And oh my goodness, how is it that you, you know, don't let the world press you into its mold. Because you'll look like whatever the world wants you to look like. This one actually is a Star Wars. That's actually Darth Vader. I don't want to look like Darth Vader. It's a, it's a Play-Doh thing. You press Play-Doh in it and then you get a Darth Vader. Anyway. But you know, that's what happens when you let the world press you into its mold. You start looking like whatever the world wants you to be. The world wants you to be selfish. So they're not helping you with your battle. Or maybe they want you to look like chocolate. What happens when we give way to living in the flesh is we let the world tell us what we will look like what we will spend our money on, where we will live, how we will work, whether we'll come to church or not. If you let the world tell you what to do, let the Spirit of God tell you what to do. Much better. So are you loving God or loving the world because we're not to love the world or the things that are in the world because if you do, the love of the Father is not in you. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. So be careful of what you look at. Be careful of the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh that desires your appetites or pride. You know, if I have this thing added to my life, I'll be better than other people. You know, some people go and ed- get an education for just that reason. So I can put plaques all over my wall and I can stand above everyone. They didn't learn anything. Lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. So whose mold are you being pressed into? Well, that's pretty easy to tell because who do you look like? Right? Do you sound like, look like, walk like, do like Jesus? Well, then you're being molded by him. And if you're not doing with a good heart, You need to get that right. So, it's better to look like him. (laughs) And it says that we're to be transformed, which means we're not the way that we should be. We're something other than what we should be. How many of you know that you're not as you should be? You were born that way, but you shouldn't stay that way, not to the extent that it is, because God intends for us to be something more and to fly far above what we've been made into. Being transformed is like that rock and that diamond. Yeah. Actually, the diamond and coal are made of the same stuff. Except one has had a whole lot more pressure. And that's interesting. That's how God creates us into diamonds too. It's the pressure that we're used to dealing with that makes us into something that's so hard it cuts everything else. 
So be transformed. That's a transformer insignia that's been Christianized. For those of you who are not Andrew. So if you want to look like Jesus, you need to look at Jesus. You know, we, you know there are so many magazines with, with you know, makeup tips and, and all sorts of things. You know, my wife gets them. I see them. They, they make excellent kindling, I can tell you. But the world is constantly trying to tell you, oh, you need to do this. And then they change their mind and say, oh, no, 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 that was so yesterday. You need to do this. And there's a whole industry based on telling you what you should do, even though nobody really told you about it. Are you being pressed into the world's mold? Or are you being transformed by Jesus? James tells us, my brethren, count it all joy whenever you fall into various trials. Woohoo! COVID again. Yeah, that's pretty much what it means. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all liberally without reproach and it will be given him. Bottom line, there's stuff that goes on in your life because God is letting it go on in your life because he doesn't want you just to be a rock of coal anymore. He wants you to be a diamond. And so are you going to accept that with grace and joy and say, Lord, I thank you that you find me worthy to give me this thing and I pray that you help me to rise to it. Or do you say, God, get me out of here. I don't like this feeling. That's when your body's in control. When your spirit's in control, you say, Lord, give me wisdom and help me understand what the heck it is that you're doing. I had COVID twice. <laughs> you're not supposed to get it twice. <laughs> so instead of freaking out about it, I say, I, I better spend the time at home. The Lord's got a plan. He wants to work something in me. He wants to work something with you. He, he's doing something. I ain't going out though. So I'm going to have to stay home. I noticed all the things that had to be done in my house. <laughs> Most of the time I didn't have the strength to do anything about it, but Any, anyway, yes. Thank you, Lord. And if you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives to everyone liberally without finding reproach, without finding, oh, well, I can't give you wisdom. You're, you're too fleshly. But that's what it means. God doesn't find a fault with you and say, no, I'm sorry, I can't give you wisdom. No, it says he gives to all without finding fault. He gives liberally. So ask him. That we should be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. How many of you need your mind renewed? Oh, yeah, I do. I know I do. If I do, I'm sure some of you do. You know, you feel like you got your head in the clouds. You ever walk into a room and forget why you went in? I got some all timers. Or some some timers or most of the timers. I, I got something. Spiritually, the same thing can happen to us if we're not renewing our minds. Our minds can get old and forgetful and we start to forget what our lives are really about and what we're supposed to be doing. So we need to rejuvenate this, this thing, our mind and what we think about because what you begin to think about, you begin to set your affections on. And once you set your affections on, that is what motivates your body to do and to reach out and to go. That is the process of motivation. You have to think of something first. And then what you do is you begin to have an affection for it. And then you go after it. So how long is it before I continually think things that don't honor God and my heart develops an affection? How long do you think it's going to be until I actually do the thing I'm thinking? That's the scary part. So I need to change my mind. Please excuse the mess during renovation. My brain is under renovation. Please excuse the mess. You know, you see that all, you go to places and they're remodeling. Uh, you go to a hotel and they're remodeling and they put up the signs, you know. Please don't mind the mess. Don't mind the renovation or, or it's the, the roads, you know. Or your tax dollars, hard at work. There's seven guys leaning on shovels looking at one guy in a hole. 
Your tax dollar are hard at work, at least in that one guy. <laughs> so please excuse the mess during renovation and let God transform your mind. And of course, you go on the internet and you'll find, you know, 10 steps to a renewed mind, seven steps to a renewed mind, 50 things you can do to renew your mind, 30 days of renewing your mind. I've looked at them, I, I know, I'm telling you the truth. There's a thousand ways that you can renew your mind and the scripture is full of them. But for this crowd and for myself, I have two. Because I figured you could remember two. In Ephesians, about renewing our mind, it says, if indeed you have heard of him and have been taught by him, as the truth in Jesus that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So there's a putting off and a putting on. The putting on there's a whole Bible full of things to put on. To put off, you know what you got to put off because the Lord tells you that. Let each one of you, oh, so therefore, verse 25, and here are some examples of things to put off and put on. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor for we are members of one another. Be angry. I like that one. And do not sin. That's a little harder. You can be angry. By the way, it's not a sin. But sometimes it is. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, don't let it boil overnight. Nor give place to the devil. Because that's what you do. You give him a foothold. You give him, you give him something where he begins climbing on your back and, and inhibiting you. Let him who, steal, who stole steal no longer but rather let him labor, working with his hands that which is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. So instead of stealing, you should be manufacturing and giving things away, which is the opposite of stealing, isn't it? So give up your stealing and start making stuff and work and do something for someone else. Let no corrupt word proceed from your mouth. That means anything that comes out of your face that has been tainted with flesh, which is much easier it's a much easier thing to just stop cursing and using certain four-letter words than it is to not say anything that's corrupted. Like if 1% of it is bad, then it's all bad. You know, how, how much mold is acceptable on a thing in your refrigerator before you throw it away? Any. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and necessary for edification, that it might strengthen somebody, that it may impart grace to the hearers. So the only thing that we should be speaking is something that's helpful for somebody else. And sometimes that's, you need a Tic Tac. But it imparts grace to the hearers and to everyone else that they're going to talk to. That it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. In other words, you're stuck with him. You ever want to get rid of the Holy Spirit and not feel bad about doing something stupid? I guess I'm the only one. Okay. There are times I regretted becoming a Christian because I didn't know what happened to me and I couldn't do stupid things anymore because I felt miserable. And I was grieving the Holy Spirit of God. God's like, oh, really? I beseeched you in everything. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of whom you were sealed to the day of redemption. Something else to take off. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, which is just blah, 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 blah. Just a lot of talking. And evil speaking. That means intentionally trying to hurt somebody. To be put away from you with all malice. That, that's when you sit and you say, hmm, how can I get this guy back? Put it all away. And be kind to one another. You know what it is to be kind? When, when somebody gives you some unkindness and you bless them anyway and you pray for them and you show love to them and you say, hey, listen, what's wrong with you? Not, what's wrong with you? But really, what's wrong with you? Are you okay? Because something's off. That's kind. When you can take a smack and be able to reach out and help the other person who just smacked you. Be kind to one another. Tender hearted. In other words, you care about other people. Forgiving one another. 
And here's the hard part. Even as God in Christ forgave you, we're supposed to forgive the way God forgave us. He forgave us completely. You know, he doesn't remember one single sin of mine or yours. Hey, Lord, you remember that thing I told you about yesterday? No, I definitely remember forgetting that. <laughs> That's how we're to forgive. So there's some things to take off and put on. Number one, decide who you live for. Who is it you live for? You live for you? Okay, no problem. It's not going to work out on Judgment Day, but you can do that. It's your life. Who are you going to live for? Proverbs 7a says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. You know, the way you paint yourself in your own mind and the way you think you are, that, that's what you'll become. So if you think you're not good enough, if you think you're not smart enough, if you think you're worthless, if you think God's mad at you, guess what you're going to do? A bunch of stupid things. But if you remember all the things that the scripture tells you, how are you going to behave? You're going to behave like a person who's inherited heaven. Anyway. So you want to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is a brainwashing of a different kind. It says in Romans 8, 5 to 7, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds in the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor can it be. If you don't have a relationship with the Lord, you don't even have the strength to be able to do the right things. You might for a short period of time, but you don't have what it takes. Colossians 3, 1 to 3 says, Then you were raised with Christ. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things in the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. It says in Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good, of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Because mostly what we meditate on is whatever the TV tells you to meditate on, or whatever the internet tells you to meditate on, or whatever your friends are talking about. And the problem is we meditate on those things that we shouldn't. We don't think, center our mind about the truth of who God is. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Without a renewed mind, you don't know God's will, essentially. But when you get a renewed mind and you're willing to be transformed, formed and you're willing to die to yourself and be a living sacrifice, you begin to understand God's will for your life. And there's two things. There's the tearing down and then there's the building up. And those are the two things. There's putting off and there's putting on. That's it. There's stuff from your life that you know the Spirit of God would like you to get rid of, and then there are things that he would like to build in your life. To understand God's will, you must have a renewed mind. 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So you see... We take these weapons and we tear down everything that's against Christ and we build up all those things that are for Christ. It is just the, that simple in those two things. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. First, you have to decide to die. All of you. You need, to you need to decide that you are going to die to everything that is of this world and not of God. So you need to have a funeral. Number two, you have to resist the conformity 
so that you're not being pushed into the world's mold, not being made in some other likeness. So what you need to do is get yourself armored up and realize that the world is trying to attack you and the world is trying to contaminate your mind and your life. So you need to be on guard. You can't listen to everything you hear and you can't spend hours, countless hours in front of the TV and the internet and think it's not going to have any circumstance on your brain and the way you think. <coughs> so prepare for the battle. Get suited up. Ask God for wisdom. Number three, transform by reform. In other words, you got to get information in. <coughs> Sorry. You have to get information in. <coughs> That's going to help you and make you more like him and less like the world. So scrub your brain. <laughs> Renew your mind. Get in the word of God. Find a good Bible teacher that you like to learn from. Open the book. Get on your knees. Come to church. Do all of those things. I'm preaching to the choir, I realize. Do those things that you know will feed your spirit. Have fellowship with somebody who, who's maybe a little further up the road than you. Get discipled. Get in the word. Get busy about doing the thing that God's called you to do. You could be a lot more busy for the Lord, right? So get your mind cleaned up and you'll do what the Lord would have you do. Mm -hmm.